Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Body Wisdom Podcast, where we discuss the mind-body connection and its relationship to health and well-being. My name is Tammy Bulmash, and today we have a very special guest, Sumi Como, who will be joining us all the way from Boulder, Colorado. Sumi Como has created an original way of working with individuals and groups that can bring conscious awareness and awakened presence into life. Her dedicated study of the Alexander Technique and Zen Buddhism complements her experience as a professional dancer, athlete, and yogi. She now brings forth the deep gifts of the Alexander Technique, Zen Meditation, and Merce Cunningham Dance. Sumi Como completed her Alexander Technique training with Patrick McDonald, who was one of the first students of FM Alexander, the founder of the Alexander Technique. Sumi has been teaching the Alexander Technique since 1981 and began her first teacher training course in 1990 in Boulder, Colorado. She had another teacher training course in Austin, Texas for 20 years. Her work has focused on people of all ages and from all walks of life, especially professional dancers, actors, musicians, martial artists, and athletes. Sumi is a Zen Buddhist priestess in the lineage of Mai Zumi, Roshi. She has been teaching Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan, Qigong, and yoga for almost three decades. She is a senior member of the Integral Yoga Teachers Association. She is qualified to train yoga teachers at the basic level of 200-hour certification. Sumi returned to Boulder, Colorado, where she has restarted her Alexander Technique training course and recreated her dance company, Komi Dance Works. Como Dance Works. Hi, Sumi, and welcome to our show. I am so, so happy to have you here with us today. And I'm so happy to be here. Um, look, I've been looking forward to it, as are my students and what? friends. Wonderful. I'm sure that everyone, not only your students and friends, are going to enjoy hearing from you and the wonderful things that you've been doing. How are things in Boulder? I see that it's quite sunny um, in the back, so I, I'm guessing that the weather is nice. Yes, except we had snow this week and rain, but this is the weather in Colorado, and <clears throat> so we'll have snow, it'll melt, and now it's 60 today. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, that's nice. It's, it's cool, but but bright and sunny. Yeah. Which is wonderful. Well, Sumi, you have a fascinating background. You've done many things, and I wanted to hear more about your journey with the Alexander Technique, Buddhism, meditation, and dance. And um, basically, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about that journey and what you did first and how these different disciplines uh, work together. Wonderful. I'd be glad to talk about that. I've been dancing since I was a little girl, you know, and I did ballet, and then I seemed to have had a break when I was in high school, which actually wasn't that good for me, but I danced all kinds of other dances in those days. And then I went to Sarah Lawrence, and Sarah Lawrence has a great dance department, and I worked with Bessie Schoenberg, and she also brought in a lot of we had modern dance people who taught us as well as ballet. And uh, so there were people who came from the Cunningham studio in New York. And when I graduated, she said to me, you go to Merce. <laughs> so I listened to her and she was right. I mean, I explored other uh, uh, modern dance, a lot of other modern dance uh, practices, but really I felt very comfortable and connected to the Cunningham scene and to the technique. And what I didn't know then, which I of course learned later, was that both Merce Cunningham and John Cage studied Zen with D.T. Suzuki at um, the New School of Research. So, um, you know, there was a sense of that energy, even in the studio, and also the, uh, the sense of stillness and movement and clarity that is very related to Zen 
And I think it opened up certain things uh, in the way that Merce choreographed and the way John did music, because there's one piece he did, it's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, which is very daring. And uh, I had one student who I trained, who was a dancer, who got the uh, copyright to do that piece. And she's laid on the floor in rest position, Alexander rest position for four minutes and 33 seconds. So that was an interesting way of doing it. So anyway, um, I work with my dancers uh, in such a way, and as part of the technique, when I teach the technique class, to find a way to be still and from stillness move without anyone, uh, you know, without being pre-determined. Uh, in other words, like you could be still and then suddenly you can change. And that is part of the way that Merce worked, that um, it wasn't uh, uh, sort of revealed before it happened. And it's a very wonderful thing in terms of moment to moment awareness, um, which goes very well with our Alexander work and Zen meditation. When you're sitting, you sit, when you stand, you stand, and then you walk and move. So I have been very interested in movement in stillness and stillness in movement. And um, I see that coming from Merce Cunningham, who was a master of dance and choreography. And I feel so blessed to have had uh, quite a lot of time with him and working with him and other members of the company. And then to find the master teacher of uh, Patrick McDonald and Marjorie Barlow and Dr. Barlow. And I worked some with um, Walter Carrington and I worked a lot with Elizabeth Walker. Um, so when I was in England, I had that great opportunity to be not only under the hands of these people, but in their presence. Because one of the things that I think is profound about our work is that when somebody comes into the studio, it's not only, um, you know, what we're uh, teaching about the Alexander technique, but it's how we're teaching it and who we are. And I was very blessed as well when um, I was dancing in New York and I, I'm also a dance therapist. And I trained with a wonderful woman named Blanche Evan. And uh, she brought in an Alexander teacher to our dance therapy training. And I was just so impressed by how she moved. She looked like she had no bones. <laughs> and, um, and what she talked about, and she had us walk and so forth. And so I went up to her afterwards and I said, I'd love to do some lessons with you. It seems very intriguing. And then she told me, well, I'm pregnant, so I'm not really working. And I couldn't even tell that she was pregnant. Um, anyway, and she sent me to Sarnel Ogus. Sarnel Ogus was an amazing gift in my life. And I met her when I was quite young because I was dancing in New York. And um, so I started having lessons with her. And of course it changed my life. So she changed my life, she changed my dance, she changed who I was as a human being because I thought I was, there was nothing wrong with me. I did not go to the Alexander technique because I was in pain or that I was hurting. I went because I was intrigued. However, um, about four months later, I was coming back from a professional ballet class at the New York School of Ballet on Broadway in Manhattan. And I walked part of the way and then I got on 
the uh, train at 72nd and took the express. And when I got to 14th Street, I waited because I was going to take the local to where I lived. And it was the heat of summer. It was like the end of August. And I opened my dance bag because I had a towel. And of course, I was sweating. And there were not very many people on the station because it was in the middle of the afternoon. Well, I'm writing this book, which I'm hoping to finish in the next month or two. Um, and it's called Dancing on Sacred Ground. Anyway, I felt a hand on my back and then suddenly I was pushed. So I was pushed on the tracks of the subway train. And usually I can say that without having too much to go on. But today, because a lot of people might be listening to this, uh, I was on the tracks of the train. And uh, I flipped over, I was very small. I flipped over, landed on my back. And the next thing was, I saw the lights of the train and the sound of the train. So there must have been a blackout there. And then the next minute, the train was over me and I was underneath the train. However, I was still alive or, because the guy yelled down and said, are you alive? And I thought, I guess I must still be alive. So these are like, I, it was a near death experience, but there I was. Um, and my foot, my right foot was in excruciating pain. So I didn't really know what happened at the time. I knew that I was still there and conscious, seemed like an interminable time for them to, they lifted up the train and they had a stretcher. And I remember this because I remembered it on Sarni's table, actually what happened to me physically. And they put me in the ambulance. They put me on a stretcher, put me in the thing. And then I was uh, taken across the street to St. Vincent's Hospital where they gave me the last rites, but I was still alive. <laughs> so this is a horrifying story, and it is something that I think a film should be made of. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, so there I was, my foot was really hurt, but the beautiful thing, and I wanted to say this quickly because it'll be in the book, is that this nun came in and she held my hand and she said and now i feel teary-eyed when i say it because i remember it so well she said it's a miracle you're alive god has saved you for a special purpose and then i must have passed out and then i woke up in a hospital bed with my foot all wrapped up. The rest is her story, which is that nobody asked me and they amputated some of my toes, including my big toe. So it was an amazing journey. So Sarni actually came into the hospital and worked with me. However, since I had been dancing six hours a day, doing yoga, riding my racing bikes, all kinds of things, running, I directed all the time, nonstop, because what else could I do? The other thing I did was a ballet bar on one leg because I couldn't put my right foot down. So it's a whole story. I actually was in the hospital for three months which I can tell you was awful. So I wrote poetry and I drew and painted pictures. And I actually uh, visualized myself giving myself a Cunningham class. It's a very, and I did the ballet bar on one leg. Anyway, and then I got out and I 
rehabbed, I would go see Sarni once or twice a week still, but somebody would have to drive me because I wasn't walking very well. Um, in any case, there was one lesson with her where I came out of the lesson and I was balanced, you know, and I was walking normally. Well, that was a revelation because, you know, I had to walk and retrain myself as a dancer. Anyway, so what that did was reveal to me that it was possible because I had that moment and I think it lasted a few hours. But then, you know, I had to learn how to balance with not having my whole and then I went back to the studio and started all over again. So this is a long time later. I dance, I perform, I even have danced here. However, all of this, dance, Alexander, yoga, everything. And the yoga helped a lot. I did all floor asanas. You know. Led me to Zen. And the reason it led me to Zen is because Zen meditation deals with the challenge of suffering. And in a way, part of the reason I eventually became an Alexander, I felt that we, there's a lot of suffering in our world and it's suffering from pain, it's suffering from mental distress, emotional distress, trauma. And um, I felt like Alexander technique as a work was an opportunity to be of beneficial service and kindness to people rather than people having to take drugs for pain or have operations for pain. And when, what is interesting is that when I went back to the orthopedist and showed him that I could do a releve and then I could, you know, on my, and I could balance on one leg, he, he could hardly believe it. And then I was walking normally. So all these things, you know, we have a lot to... Um, offer to the medical people who are open to it. And so uh, I know that Judy Stern and other people helped set up things at the rehab center in New York, and then there's other rehab centers. And, um, you know, we have remarkable changes with people who are suffering from pain or back pain, neck pain. We have a study from 2008 that was done in England. Do you know about that? Yes. A lot of people don't, but nobody knows about the Alexander work. That's what's sad to me. You know, in England, there is a lot going on. Anyway, so I diverge, but I'm trying to... Um, talk about how Alexander, Zen, and dance all um, sort of integrated in me because it was my life and it was my dance. And I think that one of the things that people don't um, maybe emphasize enough is that Alexander uh, did the discovery that we read about in the use of the self because he was having trouble with his voice and the doctors offered him an opportunity to, uh, you know, work on his vocal cords or something. And he was very astute. There was a little noise coming in. And he said, if when I rest my voice, it is fine. When I use it to perform, and actually it was performing 
more intense aspects of Shakespeare, which there are a lot of, he would lose his voice. And so I've had a lot of experience working with actors and singers and all kinds of musicians and of course dancers. So we know how much the work can help people, but it was his uh, dedication and determination in his art of performing that um, stimulated or inspired him to really spend the time he did to figure out the work. And so I think those of us, like what happened to me, oh, I mean, I, physical therapy is great, but for me, it was boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I really got on my bike and I went back to dance and did Alexander and yoga. And uh, so on that level, that was how I rehabbed. So, and that is how that has been part of my life for the last many decades. So, yeah. And I've brought, I, teach yoga with an Alexander orientation. I teach Tai Chi, which is very connected to Alexander and the woman that I worked with in England, who was wonderful. Her name was um, Gerda Geddes. She had studied in China with the grandson of Yang and came back to England and was teaching in London at the place, which is where dancers, modern dancers train. So the day that I started my Alexander training with Patrick McDonald, I had already started Tai Chi with Mrs. Geddes. And luckily the time worked out. So I saw her, her class was midday and then I had to get down to Victoria by two to get to the training course. So all of these things have um, integrated and you know, been part of who I am. And then the thing was, I got a job being an American, despite being an American, <laughs> at the Buddhist Society, which was a five minute run from the Alexander training. And uh, so I worked there in the morning, went to the training, and then I started sitting and meditating with the Zen group there was actually a Rinzai group, which was very uh, tough, I would say, because my teacher was already Maizumi Roshi, but he was in America. So he said, whoever you sit with, just sit. <laughs> and the thing was, I had a really hard time because there was an emphasis on an arch in the lower back in the Zen meditation. But then when I looked at Maizumi Roshi and the Japanese teachers, they were all very lengthened and open. And I used to give Maizumi Roshi uh, Alexander lessons, <laughs> which was really uh, uh, nerve wracking for me <laughs> because he would say, Sumi, what are you doing? You know, your teacher, all your teachers kind of wake you up. Uh, right. And I believe it's best to wake people up with kindness rather than yelling or yes. uh, something <laughs> or making them feel wrong. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, in the more subtle aspects of Zazen and the practice. It's being with what is, and I feel that that is very relevant in our Alexander work because people are very hard on themselves and constantly judging us and already in a place of right and wrong rather than in a place of, well, isn't that interesting? And opening to curiosity. So... <clears throat> I don't think the Alexander technique is about judging people. 
no. or saying this is the way it is and this is the way it isn't. It's about finding what is the appropriate aligned and active energized place for us to be. And it's hard to do that if we're like this, you know, well, you can't see me. But if you're collapsed, um, it's hard. And if you're stiffly held up, it's hard too, because there's no flow. And I believe that there is a flow that both Marjorie Barlow and Mr. McDonald talked about a lot that has to do with a certain vitality in the system, which is why they all live so long. <laughs> you know, like uh, Elizabeth Walker was 99. Wow. Uh, I think that Carrington was like 97. I mean, he was still very awake, but he was not moving so much. Uh, McDonald only lived till 81, but he had epilepsy and he had a spinal deformity, which you never, I didn't really realize. And uh, he was very alive and awake and teaching very close to the time he died. So the other thing I, was, I used to say to people, <laughs> and I think I still would like to say it, that this work is youth enhancing. <laughs> I love that. It is. Because Sarni, I hope she won't mind. I won't tell her exact age, but I don't think she minds. She's over, she's in her 90s. And when I see her, which I haven't seen her now for over a year, but I'm hoping to see her this year. Uh, she remembers things about me when I was a young dancer in New York that I tell her not to talk to my training course about, <laughs> you know, because I brought her to my training courses and um, she remembers things I like to forget. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, but she has been my mentor for this whole entire lifetime. And she knows me from before I had the accident to what's happened afterwards. and. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that the work is <clears throat> so profound and so deep and has the opportunity to really transform people at a level that isn't about fixing. Right. Nobody needs to be fixed. We need to learn and we need to let go. And it seems like it's a lifelong process. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I, uh, I also think that there are a lot of people who are struggling right now during the pandemic. They're, you know, just going through really difficult times. Many of them are depressed and alone, isolated. And um, I wanted to share a passage that you wrote um, on your website. You have a lot of beautiful passages that you wrote. And this one said, I'd actually like to read two of them, but, um, the first is, during these challenging times in which we live, tensile strength can be revealed. There are deep dimensions of courage, clarity, and compassion that can come from the, that can come from the precious stillness within, in the here and now. And you also wrote, let us learn to be fluid and graceful like water, sturdy like the earth, light like the air, and bright and energized like fire. Let us enter into the endless space of ether with body, with, with both sound and silence. And so um, these are beautiful, beautiful words of, of wisdom. You're a beautiful writer. And- uh, That's where I better finish this book. Yes, yes, hopefully you will. Um, I think it's, it is something that would inspire and help a lot of people. Um, you have a very gentle, graceful quality about you when you speak and also when you write. And uh, I wanted to know if there's anything you could perhaps say to our listeners about how, how can they get started? on this journey 
when they're feeling broken, alone, isolated, or that they don't think they can be fixed, you know, and uh, we don't fix people, but how can you sort of maybe suggest a way to help people take that next step? Well, I think that the technology, which you know that I'm not very um, <laughs> fluid with, um, is a helpful way for people to connect because we're not, you know, hopefully we'll start connecting more in person. I'm actually with a friend in Portland and we have Zoom Zen every morning at 7 a.m. And you really actually feel like you're sitting with them. So with the Alexander technique, I think it's possible to teach certain things through Zoom. And some of it has to do with, well, just simple things like, how am I sitting? What's happening with my breathing? Teaching the lying down work. I also teach something where I ask people to put their feet on the wall and have their, um, you can't see, but you have your, um, uh, your lower leg parallel to the floor, um, your calf and your foot is flexed and that allows the lower back to let go. <clears throat> it can be done with your feet on a chair or your calves on a chair. And I just gave that to somebody who was uh, having trouble with their lower back uh, because it's about letting go and feeling the support of the floor like somebody would feel on the table or we can work on the floor as well. It's just that <clears throat> my experience uh, of the amazing hands-on work of the first generation teachers that I have been working with transmitting to people in my training courses is so subtle and so deep and so profound that hopefully we will, I mean, I do work with people in person, masks on, more people here are having, um, you know, have been vaccinated. Um, so, there, there's a book that my dance therapy teacher told me it was part of our reading. It's called Touching by Ashley Montague. And how we hold, oh, I love working with pregnant women, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people with their children. Because the original touch of the mother how the mother holds the baby, how the mother nurses, transmits a tremendous amount to this baby, which is so open, you know, and affects their nervous system. And I've also worked with a man named Peter Levine, who has done a lot of work with trauma. Um, uh, so, and he used to actually, what's interesting, he used to come visit our training course here in Boulder. And um, he actually sent a lot of people to my first husband who was English and who had trained with me in uh, London with Mr. McDonald, because he said that um, men, but everybody, uh, it's good for them to experience a gentle, sensitive man. And a lot of that kind of energetic is happening in this country now because we're looking at how people are disregarded for, you know, their gender, their color, their culture it's horrifying and it's so unlike what this work is about you know this work is about uh, transforming us as human beings to be more conscious more loving more kind 
more open to everybody. You know, so it's uh, it's hard to see actually for us because um, it's totally not what the work is about. You know, the work is about being present to oneself so you can be open and present to another in a kind way. And that's why the quality of touch and touching is very important. Don't you think? Absolutely. I, I miss touch so much. That's something that um, has been missing from this this pandemic period is not being able to put hands on on people other than people in my family. <laughs> um, and I miss I miss touch because very lucky there. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What? I said they're very lucky to have you right here. <laughs> oh yeah, well the family. Yes, well it's, it's it's I love working with my kid. I mean working. I don't I don't really do a lot of hands on with them, but um, sometimes just they they put their hands on me. <laughs> That's just joy having young open hands. Just t the the touch that you receive from a child is just so pure, and it's, it's wonderful. yeah, it's it's joy. It's it's uh it's definitely uplifting. Um, and, but I do miss it because part of what's so great about having these lessons with people uh, is that it's not just us teaching them, they teach us. And they teach us with touch, with letting us put our, our hands on them and uh, receiving that feedback. And, uh, and it's a healing. It, there's a, I, I'm not going to say the Alexander technique is like this healing uh, thing. It can be if, if you want to look at it that way, but there I think is a healing quality to the work that um, it is an educational tool with a therapeutic benefit but it's not a yeah. treatment per se but it does have that therapeutic benefit i think yes and there's a, a word therapia which i think is greek which means healing and education mm. ah i love it yeah it's nice and Marjorie would say, of course, it's about re-education and it's about integration so that we're not just separately this mind or this body or this emotional thing. It's all connected. And, and I think that's part of what the work does and all the research that Tim Cacciatore and uh, Rajel and some of the other people, which I talked about just a little bit when I gave the memorial lecture in 2015, is demonstrated that what happens when the head is balanced on top of the spine and the neck is released, it affects the musculature, it affects the nervous system, it affects how we move, and it's not a matter of a stiff holding place. It's a matter of everything moving in a um, connected and integrated way. Absolutely. And that actually is what drew me to the work, was seeing the way people moved. Um, and one time, <laughs> uh, I where the training course was was downstairs in the basement and we would all joke about being in the basement and hopefully going up and moving uh, but sometimes i'd have to wait you know of course to cross the street because in england everything's opposite and i was like oh where are these cars going to come from you know so i had to learn to wait and to be still and see when I can go. But one time I said to Mr. McDonald, I said, oh my God, the way people walk and move, they must be in such pain. And he said, they don't know. Yeah. And he also said that the work was very magical and mystical in a way because he, when he would work with me and i always wanted to be taller i don't know you can't tell 
that I'm not very tall. But everybody I know, my kids, my friends, everybody's tall. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he worked with me and I would come up and come up and I'd think, wow, I'm so much taller. And I'd turn to him and I'd say, well, is it going to stay that way? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and he said, well, you have to just keep working on yourself. Yes. That's, that's... And I think that's the other thing that's wonderful, that we do have to continue to work on ourselves. And um, this time of COVID and, um, has been challenging for us even because we're not working with people or we haven't been and uh, as human beings we are meant to be in contact community touch yeah. so I feel like the work has tremendous uh, things to offer this time and people who are suffering because um, people's mental states are very um, agitated, which of course is trans translated to the body. Yes, absolutely. Well, you have one of the few schools that um, are operating uh, during the pandemic. You're restarting your uh, training school in Boulder, Colorado, which I think is exciting for people in Boulder, Colorado, that they get to have you right in their backyard. <laughs> um, <laughs> can anyone train? Could you uh, let our our listeners know um, what it takes to become an Alexander Technique student and what it's like, that experience? Well, I, you know, on my website, I have my brochure for the training course. Um, I generally encourage people to have 10, 20 lessons. And then both I and they have an understanding of what the work can be and whether it's helpful for them. And I ask people to write a letter of intention. You know, why would you want to become an Alexander teacher? And people have many reasons. And in England, there were many people who trained and actually didn't teach. They went and went back to whatever they were doing. Or I remember one person in Shoshana's class when I went back uh, probably a year before she died at 88, I said, well, what made you train? Because he was a financial advisor. <laughs> so it was well, obviously not <laughs> finances. And he said to me, well, I see this as my life insurance and my health insurance. Wow. And I thought, that is great. And I just had my well woman's checkup and there was absolutely nothing out of line. Which was, I think I'm lucky, but still it was nice. And you know, it's, uh, we affect the whole human being. And Dr. Barlow would say, this is the real medicine. It's not alternative medicine. The real medicine is how do we find a balance and a harmony in our whole being. And the Barlows were skiing in their 70s, you know. And uh, yeah, so I, my uh, concern is not enough people know about the work. Right. And that um, I had somebody come to me who had hip issues. And uh, after she would leave the lesson, she was walking better, moving better. She didn't have pain. She went to the doctor, the medical doctor, and he said, well, you need hip replacements because you have bone against bone. So that's what she did. She's only in her 50s. I don't know how long the hip replacements will last. And she is a mail deliverer, so she walks a lot. But it's like, why wouldn't you take the opportunity and the chance to 
experience this work rather than go and have an operation. Just people don't think that way. Right. They think, I just want to be out of pain. And one of the challenges with the work is that people need to be willing to work on themselves. And I don't believe that they work on themselves more when they're on Zoom than when you teach them in a lesson. They will be dedicated if you you say you need to think about this, you need to work with this when you're sitting in your car, when you're sitting at your computer, whatever. And um, Marjorie Barlow told me that the purpose of the training was to teach people how to work on themselves, which I always think about. When my people graduate, do they know how to work on themselves? Because when you put your hands on somebody else, you could just go where they're going instead of being the person who has harmony and balance, things like that. That's a wonderful point with that, you know, that's something that I remember learning in my training is that you can't work on somebody else until you work on yourself. Um, and so, you know, that, but that's part of the joy of a lesson also is that you're constantly working on yourself when you're working on another person, you never stop working on yourself. You don't want to give exactly. someone, you know, direction of down if you're down. So um, it's, uh, but you said it really well. Well, Sumi, this has been so informative and just wonderful to finally get to talk with you and, and to speak yeah. with you and, and to have you on our show. And I wanted to know, um, are there any final thoughts that you would like to leave with our listeners? Any last things to think about? Yeah, I think wherever you are, if you're not already involved with the Alexander work, <laughs> find yourself an Alexander teacher and you know work with them on zoom or work with them in person and really experience what's possible in this work i mean i have a lot of ideas of working with dance teachers working with music teachers working with people who are teaching people other things and um so they can offer that experience to their students and when my children were young and we were here in boulder i worked with their teachers at the montessori school here then i would go in and crawl around on the floor and work with the kids in you know sitting in circles and children as you know like in one second they're there and it's just that they change, they change really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then I worked with them. There's a sort of um, alternative school here called Uni Hill. So I worked with their teachers. I would come into the class. I'm not doing any of that now. Um, and I used to ask, there's some stuff on the Alexander Forum where people are saying, well, what do you do about working with children? Well, I worked with my children all the time, but I didn't work with them. You know, I just would put my hands on them and just go, hmm. And the thing is, my son's a competitive gymnast, or was, and my daughter's a dancer, and now she's a bodybuilder. And they both danced and did gymnastics for hours after school. So they would say, oh, mom, would you work on me? First they needed to eat, and then they said, and they would only be willing to let me touch them for 20 minutes. And I would say, that's enough. <laughs> and I would ask, I, early on, when they were really young and I was still in England, I talked to Marjorie at Barlow, mm -hmm. and she would say, you know, Sumi, you could even work with them when they're asleep as long as you don't wake them up. Um, but she said, very little is very much. Yeah. However, when they become teenagers, that's a different story. Yeah. And I'll end with one thing. I, my daughter was doing a, a summer dance program in London 
and my son had just graduated. So, and they were both born in England. So we were all in England and I brought them to have some lessons with Shoshana Kamenetz, who was uh, McDonald's colleague and then ran the Victoria School for many years. So they had lessons with her and she was able to relate to their dance and their gymnastics. She knew a lot about movement and music and so forth. So <laughs> when they finished their lessons, we're going obviously to get something to eat because <laughs> they were, you know, and my son says to me, mom, your work is pretty good, but she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone wants to have ego about the work, they need to be dropping it immediately. Because yeah. whether they're alive or not, right. there were a lot of people who were amazing. Yeah. Oh, I know. I, I agree with you completely. I completely agree. My husband, I remember he, all he knew was me when I was training. Uh, well, after I, after I trained, all he knew is, so he thought I was great. And then he had Shaike Hermlin put his, he had a lesson with Shaike, who was my teacher. Oh, yeah, and so Shaike was my teacher, Linda and Shaike. They, I trained with them. And so when my husband had a go with Shaike, he was just like, wow, I thought you were good, but wow, you know, because it's like, <laughs> Shaike, it was just like a tough. It did, that's all it was. It was a touch. And then, oh, and, and I your, remember. Yes. Because we had that conference in Israel, and I worked with him, and I worked with everybody. But Rika and Nelly and um, what was uh, Yehuda? Mm -hmm. Not Yehuda. Who was the one who started Shmuel. everything? In, Shmuel. Shmuel. I was in his class for people who'd already been teachers and I hadn't quite graduated yet. It was amazing. And there were, and Rika used to come and stay with us in London. And then we would do, um, you know, sort of postgraduate classes. I remember there are things I would never forget. I'm putting my hands on, I think, oh yeah, you know, whatever I was thinking apart from working with the person. She says to me, sue me. Where are you going down? That was a really good question because we only know what we think we know. Mm -hmm. We do not know what we don't know. That's right. And that is why it seems to me it's very important to continue to work with others. Yes. Absolutely, especially if they're in your neighborhood or <laughs> your city or even in your state. Uh, I, I fly now. I, I flew to have lessons with Barrett in New York uh, pre-pandemic, and I hope to have the opportunity to come out to Boulder and also in California and just see the oh, teachers. Yeah, that would that be would, great. Would be wonderful. Barrett's wonderful. She is. She and we were all in Israel together. Way I, It might have been at that conference. I think it was. And then she and I and Colin and some other people worked with Rika mm -hmm. for about a week after the conference. Wow. And then we were touring through Israel, and that was very scary, but she got us a <laughs> And she said, he said, well, this is a mine over here, so just be careful. <laughs> Well, Sumi, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. We had a great Thank time. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is just a pleasure. Yeah.